afternoon and welcome. Um, at Waves, I've been primarily involved in writing device drivers, and so uh, real-time audio issues relate a lot to what I do. And I've gathered some techniques over the years, which I'm going to share with you. Uh, this is not exhaustive. Uh, there are definitely going to be more techniques that uh, some of you are probably already using. So let's start. Um, first, some clarification. Um, for this talk, maybe time-constrained audio would be a more descriptive term than real-time audio, mainly because um, what I'm going to talk about deals with general purpose operating systems, not specifically real-time operating systems. Also, this talk is not about designing or writing audio software. Uh, there are other talks um, on that. Uh, last year, Pete Goodliff gave a good talk on the golden rules of audio programming. So, um, and there are other resources. Uh, the plan for this talk is uh, we'll discuss some of the difficulties encountered in working with time-constrained or real-time audio. And then we'll talk about techniques on how to overcome those difficulties. And then uh, I'm sure we'll have time for some questions. So um, regarding the difficulties uh, when dealing with real-time audio, uh, the audio callback uh, or process function has to finish its work in time every time. And what this means is adding breakpoints or stepping through code would destroy the test scenario. Uh, so traditional logging or tracing techniques are not really available for various reasons. We'll go into that, uh, some of the reasons. The other difficulty arises out of, out of the fact that visualizing audio from integers or floats is not intuitive, at least for most mortals that I know. Uh, some issues uh, may occur after long periods of operation, and sometimes hours or even days of operation. And so this requires having to capture and then analyze large volumes of data. So um, let's begin with the first difficulty. Uh, this is, this is uh, a, a general way how uh, real-time audio processing would work. Uh, you know, at a specific sample rate for a specific block size, you're given a slot of time, and you have to finish your work in time. So uh, keep in mind when I say the, the processing here, sometimes will include not just the code that you are investigating or writing, but other code. There may be other plugins which are running in, in the same host, or if you are the host, there may be uh, plugins running under you. So all of this work has to be completed much before the, before the allotted time. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, picture shows an ideal situation where the work is finished well in time. Uh, this is a borderline case where we are pushing the boundaries. The amount of time it takes for doing the processing is close to uh, the allotted amount of time. If something like this is happening, it's sort of asking for trouble because this is going to break any time um, you know, because of delays, because some interrupts getting disabled, uh, whatever. And then this is clearly the broken case where uh, the code took more time than it was allotted. And this is going to result into audio artifacts, underruns, glitches. Uh, definitely, we don't want to get into this. So what this means is that if you are going to debug issues, you cannot break into the debugger, which means you cannot watch variables. You cannot step through code. Uh, also, it means you cannot make most system or C runtime library calls, because these may take indeterminate amount of time. These calls may block on a synchronization object or they may allocate memory, which in turn may block further. Uh, so you cannot use printf. You cannot write to a socket or a file. Uh, on Mac OS, you cannot use syslog or other variety of logs, logging functions. On Windows, um, that means you cannot use output debug string or other APIs. So uh, let's talk about a technique of how to overcome this difficulty. One technique is to, instead of logging to using APIs, you use a large array of uh, plain old data structures as a cyclic buffer. And uh, you use an index, uh, like a head, to determine where to write next. And so the time constraint callback would write into the next position. Uh, and, and then the nice thing about this is this can be done without 
need, without a need for, for any locking um, or, or acquiring any, any mutexes, uh, because the reading is going to happen from another thread or maybe another process. So, um, which will be using an independent tail index, which tries to catch up with the head. The reader also can use any system calls. Uh, it would be nice to, to enable or disable this logging at runtime. So one technique you can use is to, is to have a flag file or a registry entry on Windows, which is checked during instantiation or some other uh, context which is not really constrained. So this picture here shows uh, a general idea of how a, a circular buffer would be used. Um, so uh, let's look at a demo of how uh, this can be implemented. So for the demo, I've, based, I've changed some code of the Juice uh, audio parameter plugin tutorial, which can be downloaded from here. And we'll see how we use the lock to buffers technique. So, so this is... Uh, this is code from the, from the plugin tutorial. You see the process block function. This is what is called during, the, uh, during processing. So this is your real-time code. Uh, this is fairly simple code. It applies gain on a block of audio. Now, if you wanted to log some information to buffers, then uh, we would make some changes, as is done in, in this code here. So uh, here, we, we get hold of. Uh, of uh, entry in the log buffer, and then if logging is enabled, again we use a flag to determine that we would store certain information in the in, in the entry. So here we are uh, getting time, we are finding out number of samples, what were the values of the gain, uh, what was the phase, and then if we are doing ramping or not doing ramping over here, and then we are uh, store once we've stored all the information we increment the head. So once we increment the head, it goes to the next slot. Uh, once again, there is no need for any logging here. So let's um, look at what is, is done to prepare this, uh, this buffer. So what we do is, in the, in the constructor, we are, uh, we are going to use a memory mapped file, because the idea is we are going to use a shared buffer between two processes. So uh, this plugin is going to write data to this shared memory buffer, and another process is going to read data from this <coughs> buffer and dump it. So basically, we create a memory mapped file, and we get a pointer to that, and we are just going to use, we initialize it. We initialize the head and, and the data. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a plain old data structure. And let's look at what the, the circular buffer is like. So uh, this is the log debug structure. This is the data structure in which we are going to store. We store uh, the head, and there are the actual entries. And these are the, the members here, which are going to be stored in this. And so now let's look how this is going to be read. Uh, so for that, we have a simple command line application. Uh, which is going to, again, open access the, the memory mapped file. And it's going to, uh, to begin with, it's going to uh, read the, the head and tail, make, bring them together. And then it just simply runs a, a simple while loop. It checks if the, if the tail is different from the head. If it is, then it's going to read the next entry, dump it out, and then move ahead. So. Um, Let's see this in action. So I, I uh, so this is the plugin, uh, the which I modified, and this is, these are the gain values which are going to change, and we are going to see how this is read by the console application. So as soon as I start moving this, you see these values are being dumped here. This can be stored in a file or uh, for later analysis. So that's, that concludes the first demo. OK, uh, now there is a variant of the logging to buffers technique, uh, which is much simpler to use. This is available on Mac OS only. It's called FireLog. Um, this requires two Macs to work. Um, there is the target, which runs the code that needs to be debugged. 
And then there is a monitor Mac, which is the second Mac. This runs the Firelog app, which displays and stores the logs. Uh, logging is done via a call to Firelog function, which is uh, identical to using printf. Uh, this function, the important thing about Firelog is this was designed for logging and for really uh, low overhead logging. So all it does is, is it writes data to a memory buffer. Uh, there is uh, negligible CPU usage when you make this call, and that's why it's able to achieve extremely low overhead logging uh, without losing uh, data. Uh, monitoring is done via Firelog app, which runs on a separate Mac on the monitor Mac. This reads the memory buffer on the target Mac via Firewire and PCI bus mastering. Uh, so effectively, this can even read memory buffer of a Mac, which has kernel panicked or is completely frozen, because the CPU on the target Mac is not being used to read the data. It uses PCI bus mastering. Uh, and of course, it can display logs in real time with fairly accurate timestamps, which are obtained again by the PCI bus. So. Uh, uh, this picture dis uh, tries to show this um, how the tasks are separated between the the target and the and the monitor. The target is running the code uh, application or plugin uh, using Firelog framework. It uses the Firelog kernel extension, which would allocate a memory buffer and provide a user mode address to the application, and and mark this buffer as being shareable on Firewire. So when you want to log, you make uh, a call to Firelog, and Firelog will simply write data to this buffer. That's all the Firelog call does. Uh, on the monitor Mac, when the Firelog application runs, it will uh, repetitively uh, send Firewire uh, commands to read that memory buffer. So it goes through the PCI bus, through the Firewire controller, and then it goes to the to the target Mac, and there it reads the buffer again using PCI bus mastering. So uh, this is able to uh, read the data without involving the CPU of the target Mac. Now, uh, some details about uh, Firelog. Uh, it can work if your Mac, most modern, modern Macs don't have a Firewire port. S but this will, you will be able to use Thunderbolt to Firewire adapters for this task. Uh, newer Macs may need uh, first a Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 2 converter, which then you can use a Thunderbolt 2 to Firewire. Uh, this is until the time that they make, I don't think they're going to make a Thunderbolt 3 to Firewire, but this, this does work. Uh, target needs to have the, pa the Firelog package installed. The Firelog package includes the Firelog framework and the kernel extension. Uh, the monitor Mac only needs to run the Firelog app. It doesn't need the entire package. Uh, the Firelog function is usable from user mode as well as kernel mode. So if you are writing drivers, it's also available. Uh, especially for drivers, it's very useful as it allows retrieving logs you know, up to the point of uh, kernel panic, which is not possible using, using other mechanisms. Um, the code, of course, if you are going to use Firelog function, your, your application or plugin will need to link with the Firelog framework uh, if it's a uh, kext, uh, you'll need to declare dependency on the Firelog kext. Um, it can be used in debug or release configuration, but it's not advisable to use in regular deployment, regular release configuration, because there is dependency on Firelog, and, and uh, target Mac may not have Firelog installed. Now, uh, the Firelog application is available in only in one of the old Firewire SDKs. Uh, I know it's definitely available in the SDK 26 for sure. It may be available in newer or older uh, SDKs. Uh, the, this SDK also has detailed documentation on how to use Firelog. Uh, but the installer, the, the kernel extension and the framework installer that comes in this SDK will not run on modern Macs. But Apple has created uh, a package for more Firelog package for modern Macs which is available separately in Apple Developer Downloads. So um, I'm going to, uh, let's look at the same sample that I used before. Uh, and we will see how we need to make changes. And so, so this is the same process block function that we saw earlier. And here, 
all we are doing is if logging is enabled, we make a call into FireLog and uh, this writes the data. So it's much simpler. You don't need to create a separate data structure or share memory. All of this is taken care of by FireLog. Uh, the, the important thing is that uh, you may want a configuration in which there is no call to FireLog. So it's advisable to control it via macro or use some other mechanism. This is what I do. So if I don't enable FireLog, you know, that code does not get generated. There is no dependency on FireLog that way. So um, let's see this. So now I'm going to start using a version of the plugin which uses FireLog and we'll show it. Uh, so we'll switch to showing uh, both the Macs. Th these Macs are both connected via FireLog and we will see how that works. Okay, so I'm going to use the FireLog. Okay. Okay, so I start the FireLog application. And when you start FireLog application, it will show which Macs you have, which have FireLog uh, extension installed. And you can select that and you can start playback. And you see as I make changes here, I'm able to see things being recorded there. You can log them. This can be saved to, uh, saved to a file analyzed later. So, okay. So we'll switch back to using just the one demo. Okay. Okay. The next difficulty comes from the fact that visual, visualizing audio from data is not straightforward. Uh, if you look at buffers, even if they've been logged by a uh, buffer, you know, logging to buffer technique or fire log, uh, even if you logged audio data, you won't be able to see uh, what's happening there uh, because large amount of data is required to, to hear or see a waveform. And the problematic audio may be buried deep between a lot of other normal data. So that's why it becomes difficult. So um, one of the technique we can use to overcome this is, again, to use two machines. It doesn't have to be Mac. It can be you know, Mac or a PC or, or anything. Uh, you play audio from the target on which you have code that you want to uh, investigate and you record the, the audio on, on a separate machine. Uh, it's preferable to use all digital audio connection between the target and monitor whenever possible. Uh, and of course, to use the same sampling rate because if you're using different sampling rates, you may not see what you expect. Uh, sometimes operating system layers may be doing some sort of a sample rate conversion. Uh, make sure that's not happening if you're going to use this uh, technique. And, and you should use signals that you'll be able to recognize and understand once they're passed through the, the code or, or a system that, you want, that you're investigating. So using a sine wave is definitely a good idea. Uh, you can use sawtooth. Uh, if you use sawtooth, make sure you're not using an analog connection because, uh, because it may be going through some filtering and uh, the data may be modified uh, by this filtering. Uh, you can also use a uh, sign with, with an envelope, like a fade out or a fade in. This often helps you locate misplaced data. You know, if, if certain block, which is supposed to be at certain point of time, it's, it's misplaced, then you'll be able to recognize this uh, quickly. Uh, if you are going to use a, a, a periodic signal, like a sine wave or sawtooth, then make sure that uh, the, the cycle period you use it, the block size is not a multiple of the cycle period because sometimes if, if you have, a, this will mask the actual problem. So it's good to use some you know, odd, odd frequency for doing this kind of test. Um, sometimes you may not be able to use a signal generator or, or read a file uh, for this. So uh, if necessary, you can hard code samples into the data and just play it in a cyclic fashion. So this is also uh, a technique that you can use. So you know, this is how a sine wave is supposed to look like. You record it on the other end, and you can analyze if this is how it sh it, it's actually uh, recorded. Uh, here's a sawtooth, and this is the sign with an envelope. You know, it's fading out. So if, uh, 
if the data is misplaced, you'll be able to say whether the data jumped in time or it went back in time. So that's, uh, that's uh, another technique. Um, the other difficulty that uh, arises in, in analysis with, with uh, real-time audio data is that you have to analyze large volumes of data. Uh, some problems, as I said earlier, they, are, they appear only after long period of periods of time. So, uh, you know, just recording and looking at the waveform uh, may not be practical because, you know, at zoomed out levels, if you record it in a doll, look at the waveform, uh, with, uh, with it being zoomed out, you may not be able to see where the problem is. Uh, and also, if you are taking logs, you know, whether with logging to buffers, with fire log, or any other technique, there may be thousands or sometimes millions of lines that you have to analyze. So uh, let's see what we can do to, to overcome this difficulty. Uh, one uh, technique that's used is uh, audio cancellation. The idea is you use a DAW to record a dry and a wet, uh, wet uh, set of signals which are originating from the so same source. The dry would be following a known good path. Uh, the wet would uh, go via a path that needs investigation. And of course, we are assuming that both the paths either alter the signal in the same way or they don't alter the signal at all. Um, and we would phase inward one of the tracks, add a delay in the dry track, track to compensate for latency that may be added via the wet path. And then you sum and mix, sum or mix both tracks to a third track. And then you record all three. Uh, if there is, uh, there is any difference, if there are any artifacts, they will be quickly visible, even at zoomed out levels. Uh, once, once you have located where the problem is, you can always zoom in and see uh, what the problem is. You can count samples of artifacts, uh, cycles, you know, uh, how, how often does the problem happen. And then it can be related to block sizes or, or other correlated observation logs, CPU usage, etc. cetera. Um, so you know, this, is a, this picture just shows what, how you would do audio cancellation. Uh, there is the, the green path is the, is the dry and the, the pink is the, the wet track and you would record all three. So here's a, a sample of uh, recording uh, which was done with cancellation. As you, as you can see, the top is the, is the dry track, uh, the, the middle is the wet track and the bottom is the cancellation track. Uh, as you can see, there is um, there are, you know, there are two artifacts which are clearly visible in the, in the zoomed out level of the wet track, but there is a third artifact which was not visible at the zoomed out level, but this shows up very clearly in the cancellation uh, track. So once you know where the problem is, you can zoom in. For example, this is the zoomed in version where you can see that the, the wet track, it was recording silence at that point of time, which was not visible in the, in the other uh, view. So uh, the other technique that you can use to do automated analysis is by when you are doing logging, you log using CSV format. CSV is essentially comma separated values. Uh, so in the, in the first, first uh, row that you write, you write the names of the columns, uh, the labels for the columns. And in the other rows, uh, you would have data which is separated by commas. Uh, and then these, the nice thing is that once you have stored your data in CSV format, uh, just change the extension to CSV, and they can be opened readily in Excel numbers, OpenOffice, any, any spreadsheet application. And once you've brought the data in spreadsheet, you can do all sorts of calculations you can, uh, and, and analysis. You can do statistical analysis to find minimum, maximum, uh, average, or deviations. You can also quickly show the data uh, raw or calculated on charts to visualize trends, uh, spikes. Uh, it's really easy once it's in this form. Uh, sometimes a log may happen to contain an extra information. So if, for example, if you're using fire log or some other technique, there may be some extra things which are in the log. You can simply uh, filter them out, you know, use, a, use an editor. You know, if you're using Emacs, you have uh, keep lines, flush lines, we are using VI. Uh, there is V and G. So these can be used to filter out logs, the CSV files quickly, and then you can load them in, uh, load them in uh, spreadsheet. So uh, yeah, there is uh, 
another demo. And I'm going to go back to the same. Um, OK, first let's look at the code. So for this, I'm going to use the same plugin that we used the first, uh, in the first case. And there is just a difference in the, in the application that reads and dumps this data. And uh, essentially, it's, it looks pretty much the same, except that we have a, uh, we have a dump header, uh, which specifies the labels for the columns. And then we have the actual entry, which, which uh, writes the data to the file. So um, let's add. Okay. And we have a, so this is the same. Uh, the the plugin was the same, but now we are entering uh, dumping data in CSV format. So let's see what the CSV will look like. If you open in text in a text file, this is how it looks like. There is a header row, and then there is, you know, every row contains values which are separated by CSV files. The the nice thing is, you know, on, on the Mac, if you have a CSV file, if you just do a preview, it will show it in a, in a table format. Uh, it can uh, you can also load it in Excel. By I already stored an Excel file here. <laughs> So I'll just open this. And as you can see, this loads. And I also inserted charts. Uh, so I can use any column to quickly generate a chart. I can also have calculated, um, have calculated columns. For example, this column uh, uh, calculates the difference between start gain and end gain. And, and it shows it. And here's uh, a chart which shows the difference. So uh, this is. So this way, you will be able to see patterns very quickly uh, if you have charts there. So, OK, uh, there are some other techniques which are useful um, uh, with real-time audio debugging. And these are not uh, specific only to real-time audio. One of the things that I encourage everybody is to learn to use the command line debuggers, which are available on most platforms. You know, there's LLDB, GDB, NTSD on Windows, WinDBG on Windows. Uh, using command line debuggers, certain things you can do quickly, repetitively. Uh, you can log data. You can often log data without having to modify your code uh, if you use these, these debuggers. Um, Yes, and most of them now also support scripting, so you can even write scripts. Uh, also, some of the features uh, which are available in these debuggers may not yet be exposed in from the GUI GUI interfaces. So uh, again, these this comes in very handy. Uh, on Visual Studio, there is the immediate window, which can be very useful. Uh, on Mac OS, there is another uh, extremely powerful tool called Dtrace. Uh, Dtrace is built. Support for Dtrace is built into the OS kernel, and again, you can uh, you can uh, get a lot of information about running code using Dtrace. Uh, I've uh, added a link to a tutorial on Dtrace. Uh, I encourage everybody to to learn how to use this. This is extremely powerful tool, and it's fairly easy to use. It does not require you to make any changes into the code. It can capture data traces from from uh, code which has not been modified, which has not been instrumented. Uh, there is also, for Windows, there is event tracing for Windows. Uh, this is also a very powerful tool. Uh, but if you want to use event tracing for Windows, then you do have to instrument your code. Uh, ETW allows, again, uh, to do uh, very low overhead uh, tracing, capturing data. So this is also available. To summarize uh, about the techniques uh, I just discussed, there was logging to buffers. Uh, then there is using fire log if possible. The advantage of using fire log is it's very simple to use. It's um, it's just like using printf, and but it is limited to Mac OS, and you do need to Macs. Uh, actually, any old Mac will do because most old Macs already have FireWire ports. Uh, you can play and record known signals uh, to visualize audio. Uh, you can use audio cancellation if you are going to uh, analyze large, uh, uh, large amounts of audio data. 
Uh, and of course, you can use CSV files with spreadsheets and filtering to, to analyze large volumes of uh, buff logs that you have collected. And uh, you can learn to use command line debuggers, uh, learn to use dtrace and etw. These are also very powerful tools. So that's all I have. And Thank you, Devendra. <laughs> Any questions? I see one question here. Is writing to file not expensive most of the time? Yes, it is. That's why we don't want to do it from your real-time thread. Yes. That's why uh, we are writing to, to a buffer. And then uh, you use another another process or another thread to retrieve that data and then write to file. So, okay. Any other question? Hi. Uh, do you have any uh, Do you have any differences in terms of accuracy between the different debugging methods? Um, in terms of what accuracy? In terms of logging? In terms yeah, of in terms of logging. In terms of logging, you mean accuracy in terms of the time we get, or because so the data we are logging, it's it's um, if your if your buffer size is big enough, and if you are reading at enough uh, frequency, then you will not really be losing data, which you may be losing if you use something like uh, syslog or or, or k k printf. So, so what would the what would the big advantages of using firelog over the first method that you showed? Be. Okay. The, uh, the, the performance is kind of roughly the same. Okay. The uh, one big advantage with Firelog is you don't have to construct your own data structures. You don't have to share memory yourself because Apple has already done that for you. And the other thing is um, there may be times when you don't want to execute anything else on the system, on the same system. Uh, there are cases when you are already using, you know, you are sort of in the borderline case where you are pushing the CPU to its limits. And at that time, if you are going to add another thread or another process, it may distort the results. So in that case, using Firelog is definitely very useful. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if you got an iOS device, uh huh. Um, you can just brutally use F write to uh, write samples in the uh, callback, the mm -hmm. audio callback. Don't tell anybody, but you can mm -hmm. if it's a relatively simple thing. Number one. Number two, um, I use the amazing audio engine in my app, which is something that is not really supported anymore. Michael Tyson did it. Same audio, got the audio bus. Mm -hmm. It's again an iOS trick. And uh, there's basically just some API in there for writing stuff to a file. And it's probably doing something like you're talking about, uh, writing to an, a buffer. Yeah. So the thing is, on, on iOS, you're essentially got, you know, you're writing to Flash. You're not really writing to mm -hmm. a disk. Or like on one of these modern Macs, it's the same, same kind of thing. Um, so I agree with you. All, all the stuff you're doing is, 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 is appealing. It's, it's going to give you more accurate results. But if you just want to rock and roll with it, just do it on the same. The <laughs> The only thing I, I, I have to say on that is that you are taking a chance because there may be, when you're writing to a file, there may be blocking happening. You know, there, there are, I'm sorry? That's what Americans do. <laughs> <laughs> so it may be blocking, so the results will be unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? We have plenty of time for questions, by the way. for the very great talk. I was just wondering, uh, have you tried uh, using USB 3.1 because it improves the email stack, basically, to use a pen, but you're doing it with Fiverr? Uh, I have not tried it. I have not tried that. Yeah. Okay. Another question? Uh, I have a question. I'm a little behind with uh, Excel capabilities, but I know there was a limited amount of lines at some point which you could fit in a 
the Excel project, like yeah. 55,000. Yeah, How I think much data, data can you put? Uh, in I Excel? think they've they've got rid of they've got rid of that limit. So, <laughs> yeah, I've used uh, you know probably 300, 400,000 lines of data in Excel, and it not works millions fine. or something. Uh, yeah, I yeah, uh, yeah I've not. You can put uh, okay. So right. there you go. I believe the limit's 16 million. Okay, so that's that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and remember, if if you run into a case where you cross the 16 million, you can always split it and <laughs> or, or filter out the uninteresting stuff because a lot of time there is uninteresting stuff. This is something you can do in your code. Uh, for example, when you are logging, if you know that you know this is stuff is not going to be interesting, you can skip that. And you can have an indicator that I skip, you know, 20 lines, things. So, you know, these are these are basic guidelines. You can build upon them to to do various things. So, so you've um, told us a few ways to spot the glitches. Have you got any strategies for linking that back to the code that's at fault? Uh, yes. The the basic. Uh, so one of the things I mentioned is that you need to, once you, you've seen the glitches, then you examine the glitches. So one of the things uh, I do is I see uh, what is the size of the glitch, and that will often give me a clue as to you know, if there are various block sizes involved, uh, if, uh, if we are working on, on, say, a bus or Firewire or Ethernet, you know what your packet sizes are, so you can correlate them to the, the block sizes which are used in various parts of the system. The other thing is if you have glitches which are periodic, you can see how often they happen, and that gives clues on what could be, what could be causing that. Uh, so um, I, I can't say that there is, a, you know, there is an algorithm for that, but uh, you have to correlate with other things like CPU usage. You can also log CPU usage. You can, you can record other activity that's happening on the system. Sometimes it's performance related, so, uh, or, or maybe related to some other event that's happened during the same period. So. Any more questions? For the phase cancellation trick that you mentioned, what are some good ways to get act to get the drive signal? Because that's not always straightforward. Um, okay, it, it depends on what your situation is. Uh, if your situation, as my situation, is mostly it's transport related, in that case there is no modification. There's supposed to be no modification. Uh, sometimes you are working on a different, a newer version of your plugin, for example. But you have a known good plugin which used to work fine in the past. So in the dry path, you can put in your known good plugin. In the in the wet path, you can do things that you are working upon. So that's that's one example of how you could do that. Any more questions? I don't see any. All right, then um, thanks again for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.